Happy Sabbath, and welcome to the last, but certainly not least, lesson of the Teens Cornerstone Connection uh, Lesson 2023. This week we have Baraka and the Mission Story. In the orchestra, we have a song by Ashley, accompanied by John playing the guitar. And for the lesson panel, we have some of our Nairobi Central teens along with our teen teachers. Enjoy. A Totally New Girl is the title for today's mission. This mission, like the previous four, comes from the country of Latvia that's located in Europe in the Baltic seas. This is the fun fact about Latvia. The first church was established in the mid-1900s. The story begins with a girl called Agnes. Agnes is a very, very unhappy girl. Some days she cries, most days she's sad. Sometimes she gets angry and even refuses to eat. She sounds like a very relatable character until you realize why she's in, why she's in such a state. Agnes had an accident when she was seven years old a very, very bad car accident that left her bedridden and paralyzed. Um, this is the main reason for her behavior. Agnes was never used to staying in one place for long or being unable to do things that she could previously do with a lot of ease, like running around, using her hands to draw, playing with her friends. And so this setback really changed Agnes and it made her more sad and depressed. She'd take her classes in from her hospital bed. She'd had many different teachers come. They teach her languages, math. But none of this ever made her feel any better because she still wanted to be out there like the rest of the children her age and play and do other things that she could previously do. However, one day, things changed when she got a new teacher. And this teacher was different from the rest of the teachers she's had before. This teacher talked more about God and about heaven and how Jesus was coming soon and he was gonna take everyone to heaven and heaven is a better place. And at first she didn't quite understand it, but the more they talked, the more she realized that this message that she was hearing from this teacher was a message of hope. The teacher talked about how in heaven, the lion would walk with the lamb, everyone would have, they'd have pets, she'd be able to run, she'd be able to use her hands and legs just like she did before. And this really gave, this really gave Agnes hope. And one time, the teacher even held a big birthday party for her. It was so big, everyone came. She had children from the school come, they organized a party. They had a lot of going, going on and it was even broadcasted on the news. And this made Agnes very, very happy. And even after some time, even though the teacher stopped coming, Agnes, the message that she'd received was enough to change her for the better and to change her forever. She became more hopeful. She stopped becoming angry. She would eat. She became more pleasant to be around simply because of this message of hope that she'd received from her teacher. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help other children in Latvia know Jesus. The offering will help construct a building in Latvia's capital, Riga, where children can learn more about Jesus and his heaven filled with friends and animals and no pain or illness. I'll now say a short prayer to, for God to bless the 13th Sabbath offering. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for life and everything you've given us. Dear God, we pray that like, like the girl in this story, that you may please help your message of hope spread around the world so that more and more people may come to you. We pray for the 13th Sabbath offering, that it may build a building in the capital of Latvia where children can learn about you more and grow spiritually. Thank you for listening. Which is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Make me a servant, humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up those who. 
Good morning, good evening, good night, and good afternoon, wherever you may be watching us from. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and boy, do we have a lesson for you today. Uh, but before we start, I'll just invite uh, our panelists just to introduce ourselves, themselves from the far right there. Go ahead, sir. Yes, uh, he's given the greetings. So my name is Gideon, and I'll be taking you through the lesson today. My name is Marie. My name is Zach Osano. Uh -huh. And my name is Bismarck Lumumba. Uh, let us pray before we begin. Dear Father in heaven, O oh Lord God, we come before you, Father, at this time. We'd like to thank you so much, Father, for another opportunity to read your lesson. Please, Father, help us to understand it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, ladies and gentlemen, today we are going to be learning all about the human nature. The human nature. And particularly, we are going to be looking at pride, ambition, and humility and what do these things mean to us what do these things really mean to us you know and at the end of the day we'd like to know uh, uh, you know how should we relate with one another you know how should we think about one another in regard to uh, humility you know is humility a good thing you know is pride a bad thing you know what about ambition is ambition good or is ambition bad Right? And before we start, you know, I just wanted to let's just ask, what do you guys think? What do you guys think about all these uh, pride, ambition, the human nature in itself? And I'd just like to invite Marie just to take us through, uh, what, what, what do we think about this? Sure. Uh, in the lesson, we have the what do you think section. It asks you to pick true or false. So the first statement says, before honor and wealth comes humility. I'll say it again, before honor and wealth comes humility. What do you think of this? I personally thought it was false, but I'd like to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think, Gideon? Um, it depends on what perspective you take on this, but I think the more Christian approach to it would be that humility comes before honor and wealth. I mean, yeah, so it's true. Mm -hmm. I personally thought it was false because in this world and how everything functions is based off pride and greed and corruption. 
And the only way to get to the top is ungodly and unjust. Mm. Uh, all right. Uh, what about you, uh, Leka? What do you think? Personally, I think it depends on how one got their honor and wealth. And if they got it through dark ways, there was never humility before that. Mm -hmm. But if they got it in the right ways, sometimes they might have been humbled by life and they were humili They were humble. Yeah, they were yeah. humbled. All right, all right. The next question is, corruption, pride, and arrogance lead to worldly wealth. Is this true or is this false? Yeah, what do you guys think? It's true. How so? Um, they've been really specific here to say worldly wealth. So if it's worldly wealth, uh, there are so many people who acquire that through corruption and their pride and their arrogance because it's just worldly wealth. But if you put it in terms of general wealth, like heavenly wealth, all that come, amounts to nothing. Uh, Indeed. Well, as you have observed, when one is kind and gentle and humble, they get walked all over and don't have a chance for them to stand up and be their confident self. And in this world, that's the only way to acquire your riches. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's very insightful, Marie, actually. Uh, but it's just interesting, you know, the ideas that we have that, uh, and I think uh, Gideon put it very well, worldly wealth, worldly wealth. I have a question too. Uh, what do we think about worldly wealth as opposed to, to heavenly or eternal wealth? What do you guys think? Is there, what, what do you think about what do you think worldly wealth is? Worldly wealth is the material you have now, the car you're driving, the house you live in, the shoes you wear every day, and that's what you term as worldly wealth. And with regard to the question, it is corruption. Uh, corruption, a corrupt person, all, in one way or another, comes out successful in terms of acquiring worldly wealth. So this worldly wealth, you will always have it by this corrupt means and your pride and your arrogance. Okay, okay. What about eternal wealth? Can you gain eternal wealth through uh, corruption, pride or arrogance? Eternal wealth comes with one's behaviors, one's character traits. Mm -hmm. So to term it right, corruption, pride and arrogance are not the character traits that we see in Christ that we try to emulate in our daily lives. So because those three are not part of what we try to emulate, then they cannot be the right way to acquire that eternal wealth, but rather it will just, uh, it will just give you the earthly wealth. Earthly wealth. So you can't actually acquire eternal wealth through pride, arrogance, or corruption. In fact, if anything, uh, you think you might lose it, sure. right? I don't know if you're going to gain uh, eternal life uh, through pride, arrogance, or corruption, right? Uh, you look as if you have something to say. Yeah, you see, in worldly wealth is fame and friends and how you identify with people. I don't think anyone would ever find you cool if you came and shoved Jesus in their face or started talking about God. They want you to go party and drink and all these ungodly things. Well, with Jesus, you just have to obey him and live how he intended for you to live. All right, all right. Well, that's very insightful, and I like uh, the, the conversation that we're having here, and we've already started distinguishing between two ends, uh, uh, and we've termed them here uh, very uh, colloquially as uh, worldly wealth and eternal wealth, right? And so now I just wanted to move on to uh, Zeka. Uh, you know, we're looking here, what, 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 what does the, the pen of inspiration really um, have to say about this uh, in regard to particularly looking at the uh, uh, insights on selfish ambition because ideally you know whether you're looking for worldly wealth or you're looking for uh, eternal wealth you are ambitious you're looking for something right uh, you want your your sort of uh, 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 looking toward uh, attaining something so I don't know uh, Zeka what 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 does she have to say 
personally, I think that uh, all these aspects which have been talked about, corruption, pride, and arrogance, uh, yes, they can lead to worldly wealth, and as you've put it, might end up losing the eternal wealth. And yes, all these aspects have some sense of ambition in it. Yeah, one can be ambitious, and maybe not in the right way, can be ambitious to get some source of funds in the wrong way, or you can be ambitious to work legitly to gain a position where you want to be. So yeah, I think that all these aspects do lead to worldly wealth. Uh, I just wanted to point out, um, and it's true what you've said, you know, these things do lead to uh, worldly wealth. Uh, if you look at the lesson, uh, the father insight, there is a quote there. I don't know like, if you can be able to read it for us. Um, uh, LNG White, uh, uh, Desire of Ages, page 550. It says, mm -hmm. Christ was establishing a kingdom on different principles. He called men, not to authority, but to service. The strong to bear the infirmities of the weak. Power, position, talent, education, place their possessors under the greater obligation to serve his fellows. Yeah, yeah. Now, just from that quote, you know, just from that quote, if you read it, then you just think about it, you know, it's almost upside down. You know, this kingdom that Christ over here is building is a sort of upside down kingdom. You know, he's, the principles upon which are, they are being built are, are not of authority. You know, they say that government can only coerce through the authority. That's why they have the police. That's why we have the army. Such that if you do something wrong, then, you know, you go to jail. You know, and there's the police there to 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 uh, enforce it. However, here we're being told that you know uh, the kingdom that Christ is setting up is one where there is no authority but service. You know, and the strong bear the infirmities of the weak. You know, and these are great insights on what Christ is really telling us about humility and about eternal life and eternal wealth. Huh? Um, now. You know, and this also played out in his life, you know. There's a very good story about two sons of Zebedee uh, who came about and, uh, you know, they were seeking to rule in this kingdom, you know. They wanted to be the big kahunas. They wanted to be the ones to sit on the right, one sit on the right, one sit on the left. Uh, I'll just invite Gideon. Uh, Gideon, why don't you take us through that story? Uh, so the Into the Story section, we have three stories that give reference to the topic pride, ambition, and humility. So just to go, them, go through them quickly. Uh, after Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the true drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was first to speak. What do you think, Simon? He asked. From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the children are exempt, Jesus said to him. And that comes from Matthew chapter 17, verse 24 to 26. And the next one is from Matthew 18, 1 to 4. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed, a, placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child in the, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And the last one from Matthew 20, verse 20 to 28. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want? He asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will need to drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. 
When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their officials exercise authority over them. Not with you, instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be the first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did, did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So to understand this, uh, we should first um, have, the, have the definitions of these three terms clearly outlined in our minds, that is pride, ambition, and humility, so that we see how they have played out in these three case studies. So pride is defined as a feeling of self-worth, or esteem, uh, and excessive, a feeling of self-worth or, or esteem, excessive self-esteem, conceit, and a sense of one's own importance. Desire for power, ambition is desire for power, wealth, and success. Humility is a state of having a low estimation of one's abilities, modest and pretentious service. So these three, uh, they correlate in one way or another, but there, there has to be a line that we draw between them to understand them clearly. So humility is more often than not, people term it as someone speaking lowly of themselves, undermining yourself, not, being, not believing as much in your abilities. But um, I disagree with that because humility is the state of having low estimation of one's abilities. So it doesn't mean that because you are humble, you don't, uh, you don't do things because you are humble. You can do whatever you're doing, even in your humility, but you're not go doing it to glorify your own name. You're doing it because it is what should be done. So humility does not hinder you from doing anything big, anything small, anything, just whatever you want to do in general. But humility means that you're not doing it for your own glory. At the end of the day, you want to see that it was actually done. And if they praise you, well and good, but it was, that, that was not the essence of it. So that's what humility is. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think that's very insightful, even the definitions that you've given us. Huh? Particularly, I want to, I'm looking at the, the stories themselves huh? and just, uh, you know, how uh, radical, how radically different they are uh, from the kingdom that we know. You know, for example, you look at the first story. If you look at the first story, uh, about taxation, you know. Uh, here you have uh, Jesus talking to Peter, and he asks him a rhetorical question. He says, uh, you know, who, from whom uh, do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes from? You know, their own children or from others? You know, and he says, uh, Peter says, uh, from others, you know. And Jesus is just trying to show the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world, you know. Here, the kingdoms of this world, they'll charge you tax. You know, and if you don't, if you do not pay, then you're in big trouble. But then, in the kingdom of God, it's not really about you know inflicting uh, uh, taxation upon others. You know, but each one of us, and he emphasizes that he says that each one of us are his children, right? And then you look at the next story where he emphasizes that for you to enter the kingdom of God, you have to be like a child. You know, you have to be like a child. And later on, Zeka is going to come and explain to us the characteristics of a child. And then finally, in the final story, in the final story, he tries to cut down the ambition of these two men and to tell them that it is not indeed uh, their own ambition that will fulfill uh, the coming of the kingdom, but it is God's will, you know. And so he's really redirecting us to understand that our ambitions play a secondary role, you know, and that essentially we need to lay down self. Uh, which is exemplified particularly in the key text uh, uh, that is at, in the lesson, uh, the key text. Mary, what does the key text say and how can we apply it to our lives? The key text says, it's from Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, and it says, We demolish argument and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought 
to make it obedient to Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, totally. Uh, if you look at the Monday part, um, it's trying to tell us to do something with that key text. Yeah. yeah. So as you see the, in the key text, it's Paul is defending his ministry. Mm-hmm. Now, not everything may be relevant today as it was then. Mm-hmm. So how would you phrase this verse mm-hmm. to be relevant to you today? Yeah. Um, uh, what do the rest of the panelists think? You know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a text over here. Uh, it says, uh, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of, the, the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Um, what do you guys think that he's trying to say in that text? Um, Leka, what do you think? What I can take from this text is that uh, mm-hmm. uh, I'd like to pass this question to Gideon. <laughs> Gideon, uh, help your friend. Uh, this is just Paul trying to justify his ministry. Mm-hmm. And he says that they demolish the arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And they take captive the thought to, that make it obedient to Christ. So by demolishing arguments that go against the knowledge of God and taking captive every thought that makes it obedient to Christ, that's just them trying to say that their ministry is entirely aligned with Christ and anything that goes besides it, any argument that does not involve whatever Christ um, says, whatever whatever is Christ-like, if I may say, mm-hmm. is that they're demolishing those arguments and they're taking captive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know that, uh... Setting themselves, setting Christianity apart from what is of the world, demolishing the views and putting forward Christ's views. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, no, I, you guys are totally right. Um, you know, e- even in the, the final part of the, of, the, of the verse, it says, uh, we take captive every thought, every thought. And this really re- um, uh, 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 responds to, uh, to what our lesson is talking about, about selfish ambition and pride, you know. And he's saying that even when we are prideful, sometimes when, you know, we feel proud about what we are doing and we think that, you know, Paul was an amazing preacher. You know, he would see millions of people get converted, you know, on his preaching. And even when he would get proud of that and say, you know, without me, this gospel wouldn't go anywhere, by the way. (laughs) You know, I'm the number one here. I'm the guy. You know, and he said, even when he gets such thoughts, you know, he takes them captive and then he tries to refine those thoughts and try and, uh, uh, you know, understand that, you know, it's really, you know, the kingdom of God that is that is being set up and not really him. Right? Um, yeah. And that's, I think, very insightful. Uh, moving on swiftly, moving on swiftly, we want to look at the, the flashlight. The flashlight. Um, uh, Zeka, this is now you, the flashlight. Um, I don't know if you can, if you are able to read for us the flashlight. Um, and this particularly just talks about the characteristics of, of a little child. You know, what, what are the characteristics of a little child? The flashlight says, the simplicity, the self-forgetfulness, and the confiding life of a little child are the attributes that heaven values. These are the characteristics of real greatness. His kingdom is not characterized by earthly figures. Could you? Yeah, 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 you can go and read on that. His kingdom is characterized by earthly dignity and display. At the feet of Jesus, all these distinctions are forgotten. The rich and the poor, the knowledge and the ignorant meet together with no thought of caste or worldly preeminence, but as blood-bought souls, alike dependent upon one has redeemed that them to God. Desire of Ages, page 437. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, just tell us in your own words, what, 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 what do you understand by that? Uh, from this article, you can tell that no matter what we do here on earth, no matter what rank you have, in heaven we'll all be one, all before Christ and... We all need to be humble and just like a little child, we need to be blameless and have and try to attain the attributes which heaven requires. Yeah, yeah very good, very good. I think I agree totally with that. Uh, just even looking at the, fl- at the flashlight, um, Marie, you said something very insightful when we were just uh, having a chat out there. You said that 
Uh, uh, and just remind me, you said that uh, humility is not uh, thinking about... Yeah. Humility is not thinking le less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Mm. So you're not making yourself small, you're just not thinking about yourself, not obsessing over yourself. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was very insightful and, and really corresponds to what we're saying here. Uh, another aspect of this verse that I really liked was the fact that, uh, you know, uh, in, in the kingdom of God, you know, in the kingdom of God, and this is something that I find very uh, reassuring, even in my own life, you know, it says, uh, the kingdom of God is not characterized by earthly dignity mm, and display. Mm. At the feet of Jesus, all these distinctions are forgotten. The rich and the poor, the learned and the ignorant meet together with no thought of caste, of caste or worldly preeminence. That means, ladies and gentlemen, the, the question of this world, huh, the crux of this world, the things that are important in this world are not whether we are rich or poor, not whether we have gone to school or we haven't gone to school, huh, not whether we have a title or we don't have a title or that we are just a lay person on the street. The real agenda of this world, the real key to surviving in this world, is knowing Jesus and knowing God. And I find that um, very reassuring, that everything else pales in comparison to knowing God. All right, well, uh, moving on swiftly after that, we just want to go and look at the punchlines. Uh, the punchlines. Uh, Marie, why don't you take us through that? Uh. So uh, I'd like to ask each of you to pick a a verse that touches you and explains why. I'll go first. Um, pride leads to destruction. This is Proverbs 16, 18 and 19, okay? Pride leads to destruction and arrogance to downfall. It is better to be humble and, than to stay, and to stay poor than to be one of the arrogant and get a share of their loot. On earth, you will be prideful and arrogant. You'll get your money, you'll get your fame, you'll get your friends, but what does that amount to in the end? Your eternal life will be doomed. Instead, if you're humble and faithful, you will have, eternal, you will have a promise of eternal life in the future. Wow, that's, uh, that's very good. Uh, Gideon, uh, what is your favorite verse? Um, I'll take the last one, Romans 12, 3. It says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not drink, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each one of you. So this text tells us not to, not to put a high, a high, do I say standard? Not to put a high value, or put a high value, yeah. or put yourself out there too much. Overestimate yourself. Yeah. Yes, overestimate yourself, but have sober judgment of everything, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to you. So just, just think of yourself right. Think of yourself soberly. Don't be too, too proud about yourself, but have reasonable thought. Indeed, indeed. And it even reminds me of what Maria just told us right now, you know. Don't, don't, don't think less of yourself. You know, don't think less of yourself. Because indeed, you're a child of God. And God made you special, you know, and you are, you are special. You are beautifully and wonderfully made. Each and every part of you, you know. And this verse is just admonishing us, as uh, Gideon has rightly put it, eh, that, uh, you know, we ought to be confident that we are children of God and that he loves us. But then again, you know, we are not to be proud, you know, and uh, overestimate ourselves, you know, as better than everybody else, you know, or better than anyone else, right? Uh huh. Like, what is your favorite verse? Personally, for me, it will be John chapter 1, verse 29, which would be, Behold the lamp of the Lord, which takes away the sins of the world. Mm -hmm. As humans, we need to try to avoid all these characteristics, but we are due to fall into them at some point, and we need to repent and come back to God for help if we do. Amen. Amen. Uh, 
My favorite verse is uh, here in the punchline, it's a verse from the psalmist, and it's Psalm 131, verse 1. And it says, uh, My heart is not proud. Lord, my eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. You know? And you, know, you have to remember who's speaking here. This is David. You know? And David was a great man. And you can just see the humility that is in him. You know? he, he, he sees himself as not fit. Uh, even to concern himself with, with things that are too wonderful for him. And I pray that we might have that same, you know, uh, self-distrust, almost, self-distrust, almost, you know, and to look unto God, as uh, Zeka has rightfully said. Now, Zeka, uh, just as we, as we look to close, uh, there is a, 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 there is something on the Thursday part, Right. A quotation there by Ellen G. White from The Desire of Ages, uh, page 438. Perhaps could you read uh, that quote? Just uh, page 438. You can just read it from here. Uh. It says, mm -hmm. speaking of any bad habit that may lead to sin, Ellen White writes, our Lord is put to shame by those who claim to serve him but who misinterpret his character and multitudes are deceiving and led in false paths. Thank you very much. Now, we as Christians, we have, we have just gone through uh, a majority of the lesson and we're thinking about, uh, you know, pride, ambition and humility, you know, and this uh, quotation here is telling us that, you know, we have to really watch ourselves. Huh? Uh, what insights do you get? Why do you think that Ellen G. White is saying, or the book is saying, uh, that we need to watch ourselves, lest you know we fall, or lest we influence others uh, wrongly. As I said, uh, we are only human, and we are prone to error. So yeah, we cannot be always right. Along the way, you might stumble and fall, but what you do after you fall is what really determines. Because you might fall, and I might come back to Jesus, or I might fall and continue on the same path, and not even think of looking back to where I came from. Yeah, yeah, indeed, you know, uh, we are human beings and we fall constantly. And, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we, we have to get back. But then we also have to be careful uh, to see that, you know, we don't misrepresent the character of God, you know, uh, because people are looking at us and we are confessed Christians, you know. You can imagine that uh, the number of people that you're bound to lead astray, uh, if, you know, once you have confessed, you fall once again. Right? And so let's pray to God, as uh, Zeka rightly said, you know, let us pray to God that he may help us uh, do well. All right. Uh, finally, uh, the lesson tells us to read the book of Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Uh, Gideon, I don't know if you're able to, to open that, uh, or Marie, uh, if you're able to open uh, the book of uh, Romans 12, verse 3. Uh, and just look at, you know, you know uh, the, the admonition that's given there about how uh, pride really at the beginning of the world and we know it how pride changed angels into devils you know and how humility uh, conversely makes men uh, into angels you know you can imagine uh, do you have it yeah right, right. so romans 12 verse 3 says for by the grace given me i say to every one of you do not think of yourself more highly than you ought but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance to, with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Yeah, yeah, that's a verse that was just read by, uh, by Gideon. Um, and thank you so much, Mary, for reading it once again. And essentially what it means is that, you know, we have been given grace. We have been saved by grace. God has done a marvelous work. And if we are humble, and we rely upon him, then, you know, we shall be converted into angels, right? Um, before we close, I just want to give our panelists just, uh, you know, one or two minutes each, uh, just, to, just to say what really stood out for them in this lesson and what, and what they, they, they got. Yeah, we'll just start from Gideon there. What stood out for me uh, in the lesson is the lesson, at the end of the day, when you think about the lesson, it tells us to draw a line between pride and humility. Um, though they sound like two different worlds, a humble person and a proud, a proud person, 
uh, there is a way between those two different worlds they can connect. Someone who is humble it doesn't mean that that person is doing nothing. That person does something but does not glorify their name with it. That person is doing it for the right reasons, not doing it to be seen. You can, for instance, let's take someone making a contribution to a church project. If I come here and declare it before all of you, I have contributed this and this sum of money, that is now pride in, a, in one way or another. But if I just anonymously, I contribute the sum of money, that you've still contributed, but when you come and declare it here, you've glorified your name, and when you just do it anonymously, it will go a long way to glorifying the name of God. So we have to draw a line between pride and humility. Being humble doesn't mean you put yourself down, and doing something and getting recognition for it does not make you a proud person. If you're not giving yourself, if you're not taking yourself out there, advertising yourself, giving yourself the recognition, that is just doing it. But doing it and glorifying yourself, that's pride. So we need to be, there's a verse that uh, we've read here, and it says that, oh, it's just the Romans 12, 3. It's, if I may quote it, it says, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance to the faith God has distributed each of you. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you very much for that. Mary? Well, I take to sacrifice. Being humble being, or being proud. Most people are, act a certain way to get a certain something in their life, but it only lasts for a moment, then it's gone. How about when Jesus comes back? Do you think you'll still have your Ferrari? When, you, when Jesus comes back, you'll have your values and what you did on earth. So it's better to be humble and be sure of eternity. Yeah, that cut me right deep. Anyway, all right. Zeka, what do you think? Uh, personally, uh, this lesson made me internalize myself a lot. Because uh, I read somewhere, stated that there are two types of Christians, those who are proud and think they are humble, and those who are humble and think they are proud. And I ask myself, where do I fall between those two? Yeah, that's a question we ought all of us to ask ourselves. Huh? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to conclude with a verse. It says, uh, and this is from the book of Luke, chapter 16, verse 15. It's actually in our punchlines. And he said, he said to them, this is Jesus speaking, and he says, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your heart. What people value highly is, detest is detestable in God's sight. And so in conclusion, I just want to say that God knows us. He knows us intimately. He knows us even better than we know ourselves. Why don't we rely on him? You know, just tell him, God, I don't know what I'm doing. Help me out. All right? And I think that's really been our lesson today, that we ought to trust in God implicitly. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's been a wonderful time. We hope that you will uh, be kept by the grace of God. God bless you and goodbye. Ah, let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, O oh Lord God, we come before you, Father, this time. We'd like to thank you so much once again for the opportunity to read your lesson. Please, Father, help us. Help us to impart what we have read into our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We are so fond, humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up those who are weak. And may the prayer of my heart to be. Make me a servant, make me a servant, make me a servant today. Make me a servant, humble and me. Lord, let me those who are weak and may the prayer of my heart always
Bisbee.